they say hope is not a strategy, but indeed it becomes an uncanny one along the way, especially if you hold on to it and then you see the results. It is the sheer uh, power of hope that has brought us here, or if you like, the audacity of hope that has preserved us up until this time. And we hope that you take our example too, especially starting with joining us on the morning brief this morning on Channels Television. Good morning and welcome. I am Bukola Koka and of course, Jeffrey's here. Absolutely. And that book, Audacity of Hope, I have a copy of it. You just reminded me, reminded me of that particular book. Did you finish book. it? I, I think I read through that book because at that time it was the biggest book. Everybody wanted to know how this black man in America was able to break the jinx since the creation mm -hmm. or the independence of that state, so independence of that nation. So it was an absolute pleasure to see uh, him put his thoughts together and how he got to where he got to, uh, serving for eight years as the president of the United States of America. Talking about Barack Obama, but hey, that's not about the show. Welcome and good morning. It's a brand new week, a new week for you to get started on a brand new note. Well, coming to the end of the month exactly already already yeah. and i'm sure you're wondering Where's what's happening to that seat um, uh, i'm sure he's around somewhere he'll be here yeah. very soon that seat is going to be filled in just a moment <laughs> <laughs> they'll be coming through uh, in just a moment to join us on the program but for now Bukola and I, Bukola, speaking of yes. hope um jeffrey um we have reason to be hopeful today and for always you know even when we do not see evidence of it the children uh in kuriga community have been released and the governor gave I'm us super glad. updates yesterday i'm super uh, glad however <clears throat> he uh, corrected the number that uh, not 287 has been reported in the media but that uh, 137 students have been returned and they were about to be reunited with their families uh, yesterday he said he had um, you know been speaking with their families and that the children have been released and he uh, kept on giving kudos to the military for the work that they did that ensured the release of the children however uh, he was uh, very minimal about uh, uh, the exact nature of their release whether you know there were there was any negotiation he said what's important uh, at that material time was that the children had been released what is important is that those children that we kept shouting about for over two weeks are back with their families that's what is important but in the security parlance there's a word called release there's rescue um sometimes they may have to keep mom over it because it's a security issue and uh, it will force them to say things that they may not want to say we understand that but the most important thing right now is that those children are back with their parents and we're super glad super excited so the same energy that was used to bring out these Korea children and students is the same energy we want every other abductee around the country whether in Baronu, in Sokoto, in Benue, in the south, in the north, wherever it is everyone must be able to be part of that particular uh, rescue mission just like everyone came together to see that hey these children are released and we must commend the security agencies you know when they don't do well there's this bashing there's this mm -hmm. we talk about it because that's our job mm -hmm. section 22 of the constitution allows us to put government on their toes to be accountable to the people if the entire Nigeria comes 200 million, the government will run away. Yeah. Uh, so the media is the voice of the people. The National Assembly, the voice of the people. That's why we call the fourth estate of the REM 22. As I said, Section 22 talks about it. So we'll continue to commend the government when they do right. When they don't do right, of course, we'll do our job by mm -hmm. bringing them to the fore and ensure. And we must commend the president. Uh, I saw a release that he said as he's about to celebrate his birthday, Mm -mm. Mm. Do not buy nothing. Do not come to see him. Do not do advertorials in the, on the pages of newspaper, on radio, on television. I think the, in, in terms of relational, posi positional leadership, these small measures are absolutely important. Yes, it's significant to point out that, uh, well, we'll talk about the president continuously. Bokade joins us now. Uh, Thankfully, you see what we see about hope. Yeah. Hope has brought this is the This is the, this this is the first kind of entrance I've ever seen <laughs> on this show. So, when, drum when, did, <laughs> when did we start yes, this show? Today is the 25th of so March. I'm going to mark this day, 25th of March. It's our third month. That's why yeah. it's a different kind of show. That's why the morning show is a different kind of show. So, <laughs> goodness me. Wow. How are you, Cardi? Ah, what a weekend it was. Yes. Um, and what a day it will mm -hmm. be. Mm. I'm talking more a week it will be. As you guys were talking, good morning. 
<laughs> you should welcome me to the show. <laughs> I mean, tough, tough job getting here uh, this morning. But it's, it's quite interesting, you know, hearing you talk about the Kuriga children, really. Lots of questions to be answered. And I'm glad the way you put it, it's our job, really, to stand in the gap of sorts and ask those questions. Mm -hmm. They were kidnapped in Katuna State rescued in Zamfara state. Mm -hmm. I cannot count how many times we've had that scenario. Kidnapped in one state, rescued in another. They obviously didn't teleport all the way. They moved through the forest. Across mm -hmm. states. Across states, villages, communities. Obviously, a lot of people must have seen them and it raises questions. I think even one of the children that escaped said that uh, he saw someone on his way and, and all of that. So it raises questions. Why is it still tough? to get them and the key word as you said is released not mm -hmm. rescued so mm -hmm. what exactly played down well these are the questions we hope to get answers uh, for you today and across uh, all through the week as it is but hey something to cheer yeah indeed so many questions to ask and you know i'm about to ask them but um, suffice it to mention also that there's additional cherry news, uh, you know, to tell this morning. The governor also said the children are kidnapped in um, Kajuru community. 17 of them have had been released, and in fact, uh, gradually a number of them are returning. He didn't quite uh, reveal the details of their release, but he also clarified that it wasn't 87 had, uh, as reported. No, 87 in Kajuru. Okay, okay, Kajuru it wasn't 87 as reported in the media. So um, we need more accountability in that regard, particularly from the defense headquarters. When uh, people are kidnapped, even if the people do not report um, immediately as the, defa the um, director of defense media operations had reported, but subsequently, uh, you know, such details should be uh, made clear such that, the, you know, we don't have continuously wrong numbers yeah. being bandied in the media. But, you know, why does Kaduna become that uh, entrepot of kidnapping? As the governor said, that there's no safe haven for bandits, mm, right. but that uh, you know they come from other states into Kaduna to to kidnap. So those questions should be asked. You know, All right, Kyrie. there's a lot coming up. Yeah. Kyrie, that, yeah, what's that up? That just ties into what we have for you on the show today. It's a mix, really, but. Top on that list, 17 days of trauma and extreme conditions in captivity. Uh, those abducted students uh, in Kuriga community in Kaduna State, yes, have regained freedom in neighboring Zamfara. Well, we'll bring you the backstory on the show today. But the question in the air is, have we seen the last of these mass kidnappings? As President Tinubu says that his administration is deploying strategies to ensure safer schools. Well, um, an earlier statement signed by the governor, we'll have that one later on, yes. but there's an exercise that was meant to provide soccer, it was turned sour last week with the death of two students of the Nasarawa State University in a stampede during the distribution of palliatives. This has put the state government, human rights activists and student bodies at loggerheads over who should be held responsible for the deaths. We'll have that conversation today. Plus, science and engineering may not be everyone's favorite course, but we all use the product at one point. How much of that industrialization process is taking place in Nigeria? That's a big question as we speak with a man leading the agency charged with the mandate to nurture sustained industrialization in Nigeria through engineering infrastructure. It's a conversation you would like to be part of. Absolutely. And then our last segment we have for you is uh, what you would be asking really is it a painting is it high resolution mm -hmm. is it artificial intelligence well, exactly well, ai may be impressive with generative features it may be near perfect in fact but our guest on the show this morning has been in the game long before ai with his work going viral in nigeria and beyond but well, we found out the secret behind his art and what's more, well, you actually might even get to see him paint live on the show, guys. <laughs> <laughs> that'll be fun. Yeah, yeah that'll be fun. Maybe you'll paint us or paint one of us or paint the set. We don't know. Oh, well, we'll put paints. his art to test yeah, this yeah, morning. <laughs> so be a part of the show as always. You can do that on WhatsApp and on social media. Let us hear your thoughts about the top stories, the release of the students and other stories you'll see uh, today. And of course, the conversations. You can do that. Hashtag CTV Morning Brief on social media or on the WhatsApp number, which you see from time to time right there on your screen. It's a hand of fellowship, the very first day of the week. So let's get started. Well, 
Bless it with a bank, guys. <laughs> well, whatever it is you want to call it, but don't send uh, anything beyond messages and videos. Don't call. Don't send right. a call. Mm -hmm. So we are here to amplify your voice as much as possible. But we'll take this quick break. When we come back, how they will bring you our top stories. Absolutely. Join us again. and exhausted with blank looks on their faces. Well, that's how best to describe the abducted school children from Kuriga community in Chikun local government area of Kaduna State who have now been rescued two weeks and three days after they were taken away by bandits just in the early morning of school. The state governor, Ubasani, who confirmed the rescue of the children, commended the president and security agencies for their roles in ensuring the release of the children. As well speaking the children are here in Kaduna and of course uh, they are here uh, and as we are speaking in the next uh, few minutes I'll even be with them because I saw them earlier uh, they are in a very high spirit uh, of course uh, the military will, will hand them over to me officially by tomorrow but uh, still uh, they are here in Kaduna. I have been working closely with the military uh, to ensure that uh, we look after them. Uh, and of course, uh, we are also trying as much as possible to give them some social uh, counseling and look after them before we eventually hand them over to the families. There was nobody that ever confirmed that the children were 287. But those numbers were just figment of some people's imaginations, which they just went into the media and reported that uh, the figures were that. But today, I met the, the, the families with the children. They confirmed to me uh, that uh, the numbers given by the uh, military uh, are the correct numbers. Well, you should have seen their families who visibly excited, said that they were jubilating in the village on the news of the rescue of the children early yesterday. Well, we spoke with one of the fathers uh, of the students, and here's what he had to say. I'm here in the government house to receive my child, as the government called us to, to see our child. But we are here, even though we've not seen them, but we have been assured, we've been informed by the governor himself that these are children are with them. They are taking care of them by tomorrow. They want to do some, you know, they want to maybe give them some something. By tomorrow, after treating them, they will hand over the children to, the, to their parents. Ariota is, is just nine years old. We've been feeling very bad very very bad because we cannot expect a small child seven years nine years ten years you know in this in the hands of bandits how you know no food you know no drinking water so how do you how do you in fact you have to feel very you know you just have to how will you feel if it's your child well, those are questions from a father. Well, we're yet to see the children, but Channel's television is following the story, and it's expected to happen this morning. We're there live for you to bring you all of the updates. In the meantime, President Bola Tudubu has applauded the release of the abducted Kuriga children in Kaduna State. They were actually released in Zamfara State, but kidnapped in Kaduna State, as well as the rescue of the Sangai school pupils in Sokoto State. According to a statement by the Special Advisor on Media and Publicity to the president, Ajirin Gilali. The development emphasizes the importance of collaboration between federal and state governments for expected outcomes, especially on matters of security. Well, the president commended the National Security Advisor, the security agencies, and the Kaduna state government, stressing that in situations of mass abductions, meticulous attention and tireless dedication are crucial for achieving the best possible outcomes. The president is also assuring Nigerians that his administration is de deploying detailed strategies to ensure that schools remain safe sanctuaries of learning and not layers for wanton abductions.
Uh, two days after the death of students in a stampede in Nasarawa State, a similar tragedy struck in Bolchi State, where six persons lost their lives in a stampede during an almsgiving exercise for the poor in the state. One other person who was injured in the incident is currently receiving medical treatment at the Abubakar Tafarbalewa University Teaching Hospital in Bolchi. Well, the stampede occurred at the headquarters of the Shafa Holdings Company PLC along Joss Road, and this happened during the distribution of cash to the residents. The police public relations officer, Ahmed Wakili, confirmed the incident to Channel's television and assured that the situation has been brought under control. Meanwhile, in Nasarawa State, government officials have been visiting the families of victims of Friday's stampede, which claimed the lives of two students. The State Commissioner for Humanitarian Affairs, Margaret Elia, who led the delegation, visited Maramaba Edege in Nasarawa local government area and Kubang Village in the Panda development area of Kara local government area to condole with the families. Now, according to the commissioner, 19 of the injured students have been discharged, while four others are stable and responding to treatment with their medical bills catered for by the state government. And it's a messy situation playing out in what is meant to be Nigeria's premier medical facility. That's a university college hospital in Ibadan the Oyo State Capital, following yet another disconnection of power supply to the hospital by the Banu Electricity Distribution Company, PLC, over what it says is the non-payment of outstanding electricity bill. Now, according to the distribution company, the hospital is owing, what, 495 million naira in electricity bills. For every kilowatt of light, hour of light that you see, that you get, or anybody gets, we pay for it. And the downside of it is when we don't pay, we are charged interest. Current interest now is, uh, you know, of course, you know that some few weeks ago they increased the neighbor rate. So we pay like 26, 27 percent on our standing. Now the outstanding is 495. And this is maybe over two, three years. Now imagine what the, the exchange rate was when that money was being owed. What we are supposed to pay when their money was being owed, and what we would pay now when their money is being owed. So we are paying more. And again, I will level it with you, is because of UCH. What they do is they pay what they want, when they want, how they want. And of course, we do understand that it's a, it's a it's, I mean, the, the role that UCH plays is huge and tremendous, and we don't want to, you know, sort of rob that. But we're in a market to survive. Meanwhile, the chairman of UCH Medical Advisory Committee says that the bone of contention is a tariff being charged to them by the distribution company, which he says is commercial as against the social service status. Take a listen. We set up an uh, energy committee that will look into the way we are consuming our energy and uh, the availability of funds. They are going to raise funds. They are going to reach out to people with social capital, uh, philanthropists to support and uh, bring in donations as they have been doing. So all these things are in place uh, to make sure that we do that. Like you need to know the University College Hospital uh, above other portions of the University of Ibadan in terms of College of Medicine and some other things. The Vice Chancellor and the CMD, Chief Medical Director, they are working together to make sure that they resolve this. Because all the views that we have been hold is not only University College Hospital. College of Medicine and University of Ibadan is having a portion of it, maybe like a thought of what is being said that we are holding. So the two institutions, they are working together to make sure that they defray all these uh, uh, 16 bill, I mean debt, and make sure we don't any longer. Oh, this is not the first of such disconnections. Will it be the last? That's a big question. Let's turn our attention to security in the southeast region of the country as the Imo State Police Command is appealing to indigents of the states to cooperate and support security operatives with useful and reliable information that will help in arresting criminal elements uh, of feeling insecurity in the state. Uh, the Commissioner of Police, Danjuma Boki, made the appeal during a visit to the oil producing Agua community in Oguta local government area of the state to inspect the ongoing reconstruction of the divisional headquarters that was completely raised. Uh, by bandits in August 2022, which led to the killing of four police personnel. 
we came to assess the rate of work again to assess the security situation to enable us to redeploy personnel to man these premises because all the indigenous of the community they have deserted they have approved the authority they want the police person to return back to their own town i'm calling on the citizens of this community they should expose the bad ones we need information from them and all the unknown gunmen will be arrested and brought to book well, traditional rulers in the area say they are happy with the visit, but they are appealing to security operatives to protect them from those they describe as bandits who are taking over their land. When this place was functional, you can see that the entire community were able to have a site of relief. It for now. There's no certainty of everything. We hope that whenever they are going to send personnel, it will no longer be about four or five people. Because Agua is too large to be controlled by few elements like what was there before. So we are expecting over 40 men so that all this place will be adequately policed. From there we can know what to do. A business needs now Chinese investment in the Nigerian economy is visible in various infrastructure projects across the country. Even Chinese companies have been partners to modern changes in Nigeria for decades, and strengthening that relationship is what the Lagos Forum 2024 hopes to achieve. But scholars of Nigerian Institute of International Affairs in Lagos, which venue for the event, say it is time for Nigeria to redefine its policy with Nigeria. Well, the event is attended by a delegation led by the Chinese Consul General Yan Yukin to the event. Well, outside the country, several opposition candidates in Senegal's delayed presidential election on Sunday have declared rival Bashiru Diomaye Fai the winner after first tallies showed him taking the lead and sending opposition supporters out on the streets for early celebrations. Well, millions actually took part in a peaceful day of voting on Sunday to elect Senegal's fifth president following three years of unprecedented political turbulence, which sparked violent anti-government protests and board support for the opposition. 19 candidates were voted for across 14 regions and there had been cancellations and postponement of the polls with rumors that President Sal was seeking a third term in office. But the largely manual election process includes diaspora voting with hopes that a candidate makes over 50% of the vote. But if not, elections will have to be reconducted in two weeks. Well, Channels Television is live in Senegal for you with uh, results of that election as soon as they're in. But Russia has charged four men, which it says attacked a Moscow concert hall and killed at least 137 people. Three of them were marched blindfolded into a Moscow court, while the fourth was in a wheelchair. Well, they were all charged with committing an act of terrorism. The Islamic State group said it carried out Friday's outrage at uh, Crocker City Hall and posted a video. Russian officials, on the other hand, have claimed that Ukrainian involvement uh, are, of course, in this. But Kiev says the claim is absurd. The four were named as uh, Daldezan Mirzoev, Saidakrami Rakaboliza, uh, Samshidin Faridouni, and Mohammed Sobir Faisov. And now to sports news, it was a big weekend for Nigerian sports, not just at the Africa Games, not just in football. As the 2024 Olympic Games draw near, five more Nigerian wrestlers have joined um, Odoayo Adekoroye to qualify for the Games in Paris. Adekoroye had secured qualification to Paris last year following her bronze medal in the women's 57 kilograms at the World Championships in Belgrade. Well, Tokyo 2020 Olympic silver medalist Blessing Aborodudu, world military champion Hannah Rubin, Esther Kolawale, African Games champion Christiana Ogunsoya are the other wrestlers who are on the flight to Paris. But add to that list just yesterday, American-born Plateau State wrestler Ashton Matua, who produced a spirited display to overpower South African Justin Van Zyl in a 16-8 to pinfall to secure his very first Olympic slot. Well, those are the top stories, big stories, definitely. I'll shape the conversation today and 
all through the week, but I have Jeffrey joining me now to walk through some of your comments across social media. Exactly. Jeffrey. People have been talking naturally. You expect them to talk about the issue of um, security, yeah. the stampede, and all of that. We have people also talking about the um, president. Uh, saying do, do not celebrate me in a very in any glamorous way just right. donate that money to something else so but the one we'll be focusing on right now is the stampede in nasarawa state university uh it's going to form part of our conversation and this is coming from nikki uh it says the more you make things easier for your followers the more you make things easier for you as a leader if he can't handle distribution, how will he be able to manage the state? That's uh, criticizing the governor and the handling, handling of palliative distribution. Definitely we'll be having angles to that particular conversation exactly. for you. But let's hear what you have to say some more. Real underscore Dambari says, it's very bad. These two wouldn't have died if other options were put in place. This is not the first time it's happening and it will hopefully, well, he believes, this writer believes it may continue uh, if uh, things are not done in a safe manner, it believes. But again, we'll get more aspects to this particular one, but that's real underscore Dumbari's statement. And this is from I.K. Obiako. He said, it could have been done by a faculty or a department to lessen the gathering of such crowd at the same time. <laughs> Some level of a proposal, a proposition that better management would have resulted in maybe lesser casualty or no casualty at all. Well, speaking of the proposals for future, Ademola underscore Bash also says, please, if organizers of palliatives uh, can't ensure hitch-free exercise, they should put a stop to it. It is better to be alive than to lose life because of a few cups of grains. They should have learned from the customs palliative episode in Lagos. Very sad episode there. Very sad episode. And that's going to be well, one of the things we'll be talking about. In fact, our first conversation for the day Absolutely. has to do with that stampede. How the people who came to seek help uh, are now beneath the earth. Six feet. Two of them died in trying to get something to eat from the government when they were distributing palliatives. It's a sad a story. But we're here, to, we're here to make sure that we hear all sides of that story, what really happened. But the fact is that people were hospitalized and there were fatalities. So that's the first conversation, Carrie. Absolutely. In just a few seconds. So stay right here. We'll get all the angles to that conversation for you to ensure everyone's voice is heard. It's still the morning brief right here on Channels Television. On a Monday morning, you don't want to miss out on anything. Join us again. Margaret Elia, Commissioner for Special Duties, Humanitarian Affairs and NGOs in Nassau State, joins us on the show this morning to tell us exactly what played out and led to the loss of two students, sadly, two students of Nassau State University during uh, that distribution which you saw earlier on the show. Good morning, Madam. Welcome to the Morning Brief. Good morning. Thanks for having me this morning. Right. We've seen that the government has paid a condolence visits to the families uh, of the students who lost their lives, sadly, in that event. But questions still abound. 
what exactly played out? And I'm sure you have seen some of the comments from Nigeria and saying, what happened to planning? Was this not planned appropriately? People were just trying to get a few cups of grains. Why did it end up in them losing their lives? In fact, senior advocate of Nigeria, human rights activist Femi Falano, said that the distribution exercise was not well organized, hence uh, the avoidable tragedy, and of course his demanding compensation. But tell us, what was put in place to ensure a hitch-free uh, distribution, which everyone would expect would have been a no-brainer? First and foremost, let me extend my heartfelt condolence to the family of the two students that we lost, Grace Danladi and Rose Michael. And um, I really sympathize with the entire family, with the school management, and of course, the Nasser state government. Like you said, can we do it better? Yes, that possibility is there. And I take full responsibility of taking the rice to the university, I take full responsibility of coordinating the students. And what we did in terms of your question was to give the student the opportunity to arrange themselves. A template was given to the student union, who happens to be the such president, to gather all department students, both the, uh, the Christian foundations, the GNI, everybody that is in school so that they can sit together, plan this thing on their own because the same thing we are trying to avoid whereby government will not go in and start selecting on their own because we are not in the school, the students are. So the whole idea is to give students opportunity to do what they are comfortable doing. And that was what formed that template of putting them together so that they can actually do this on their own with the school management involved, of course. And when this happened, it, it's so sudden to, for people to lose their life over the distribution of rice. But it has happened, and we have taken our own corrections on our own part. Like, what else can we do so that this kind of stuff will not repeat itself? But madam, this doesn't exactly still explain what happened. I'm sure Nigerians want to know at what level did things go wrong? Who, who had the responsibility of planning that he didn't put the planning in place? Was it the student union body? Because we heard the governor uh, saying something close to it yesterday, but still it wasn't quite clear about um, uh, whether the student union body was... Uh, uh, not, not exactly putting things together, a template together for the planning of the distribution of the palliatives. This is instructive so that we'll know uh, where uh, uh, the responsibility would lie exactly before it gets to your table, even though you've taken responsibility for it. Thank you. So, like His Excellency, the Executive Governor of National S S uh, State shared yesterday, um, we are not so much interested in putting blames on anybody because we have two life lost. But to your question, we gave all the schools the responsibility to bring our student to us. I'm not in that school. I don't know who is who. My job was to take Christ to the school. My job was to have the least of the students, that's the beneficiaries, on that day, whereby we will compare the names of the student coming into the arena, which is a convocational center, so that we'll be able to merge their names with the rice. That is my responsibility. In terms of who is responsible in picking out the student, that is not my job. That belongs to the student union um, that did that with the school management. My own responsibility was to make sure that the rice got there, we are able to spend time with the student and like I said, for His Excellency also to share what is going on in the states, um, to give them feedbacks of some of the good things, the challenges or whatever that is going in the school. And, and to say this, this started with good intentions. Sometimes good intentions probably might not end in the right way, but the whole idea was we receive information from students, especially from, to my office, that they wanted this rights to come to them. Last year, I did the same thing, and I got a lot of bashes that some of these people that we arranged or that we organized with to take this palliative to the student did not do their job. 
forming this decision that let us go to the school ourselves and make sure that these children are captured in the right manner. The beneficiaries get exactly what we sent out to them. That is what formed that decision of going to the school. Um, where my work stop is to make sure that that rights get to that school. The planning of how the names are generated is not in my own schedule. But like I said, something bad happened. We sincerely apologize and on my, on my behalf, on the behalf of His Excellency and the ministry itself, we, we hope to do better, we hope to get better. If there is any other thing that we will do for the student, I'm quite sure for what just happened, we have learned our lesson because, that, because what we've seen now is knowing that people did not do what they're supposed to do. So if, if I get your meaning, madam, it's because of the worry that some names may be excluded. That led to the students breaking into the uh, uh, convocation arena where they wanted to go and grab the palliatives by themselves. Yes, yeah, so in, um, what, what, what is going on right now is they are trying to, the school management is investigating all this stuff. So I won't really speculate, but a name, name supposed to be generated, that's for sure. It's not just everybody to be in that conv convocational center. We're supposed to have names given to us. One, because we need that as our own data collection so that next time when we are coming to the school, the same list will not be repeated. So definitely names, we are talking about over 4,000 students because what you have in that school is 8,007.5 kg rice that was delivered on Wednesday. And for me, that rice has been in that school since Wednesday. If there's supposed to be any kind of disruption, um, like people were suggesting, it could have been done earlier before that day. Why wait till that day? And I still go back to my question. The distribution of this rice will not start till about 10 a.m. They are not even the first school that we are coming to. We have health and science tech in the same cafe that we're supposed to go to first before ending up in cafe. So by 3 a.m. from the information we gathered, because I wasn't there, students have already started coming in. Now, I still ask the question, who gave that instructions for students to be out there that early to receive palliative? That wasn't from the ministry. That wasn't from me. So those are the questions that we have right now. And like I said, until the investigation is completed, we won't know who did what. But on my part, like I said, the, responsi the responsibility part that I'm taking is the fact that the rice was taken down by me, by my ministry, the organization of how the rice will be distributed was done by me, two bags per person, for us to have at least 4,000 4, students to benefit from that palliative. The reason we're probing as much as possible, as much as we commend the fact that the government and yourself are seeking responsibility, is that two people have died. Um, no, nothing can restore that life. So we, we need to probe further so that this doesn't happen again. Now, the country is, 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 is quite a challenging situation. Um, what was the detail that was given from your ministry or from the government to say that if this happens, please don't distribute? Let me explain. I have been part of distribution of things before, and I know that we told people show up by 6 or 7, and they showed up by 2 a.m., 3 a.m. These are scenarios you should anticipate. And then when it gets overwhelming, you know what to do. So what were the kind of scenario planning you anticipated to say, if this happens, this is how it should be, and that's how it should be? Because if we don't do that now, this will happen again. People are hungry. People want help. People want soccer. They will get it by all means necessary. The, the school management, from my conversation with the school management was to make sure that we have enough security uh, in place whereby they will see one to make sure that the rice got there safe and they they can actually um identify that we actually brought the rice in there and the school management gave me their word that in terms of security we can be rest assured that this rice will be there until we get there and that the students will be waiting for our arrival in terms of making arrangement, if this kind of thing does happen, personally, we did not foresee this because if you may recall, we have done over six schools 
uh, before arriving in Kefi, the same instructions was given to the entire school. And we have, we have those school collaborated and cooperated with the ministry. Upon arrival, they were sitting on their rice. Even as a matter of fact, like I said, I always get there before my principal shows up so that I'll make sure that everything is in order. So when I get there, we have the student union, the leaders that they were dedicated to do this work, start inviting those students in. And we chose a very comfortable place whereby there will be security trying to avoid what just happened, yeah. where you have maybe an in and out um, a facility so that we, we can only have one entrance where students can come in, whereby we not have all this chaos that you just uh, saw. So in terms of our responsibility, it was done based on the assessment of what we have done for the past six schools that we visited. The question then is, how far is the state government willing to go to ensure appropriate sanctions, consequences are meted out to whomever is found culpable? And I'm talking, would it be a sanction? Would it be a suspension? Would anybody lose their job if they are found wanting in this investigation? Because and it's at the risk of sounding like a broken record. People have died unavoidably. That is, I mean, they just right. went to school to study. Right. They didn't bargain for any of this. They're not in a war-torn area where you say that it's, it's, it's a likely scenario. So how far is the state government willing to go? Is it willing to go as far as sacking people who are found wanting? I totally agree with you, and I will leave that one to the decision of His Excellency, but anybody that is found wanting, including myself, people should learn to take responsibility when things are not going well. We, we've taken credit when we did it well, and now that this happened, if any, anybody is found wanting, then they should be called to book, because at the end of the day, like you've rightly said, we've lost great souls. We don't know what will have happened to this kid if they are still around. And that was what from the decision, because when I got to Kefi, instead of heading to the first place that the palliative is supposed to take place, I immediately went to the school. And I'm quite sure maybe if there's a couple of pictures that will show me coming out of my car, chasing after some of the students that I saw with a bag of rice, because I needed to get information. Why are they walking around with rice when the time for the distribution has not even commenced yet? I have some documents that I, I, I seized from some of the students because those kind of uh, student will be able to give us more information firsthand of what actually happened. And from there, I proceeded to the uh, medical center to check on those kids that were uh, crushed, those ones that were hurt. At the point that I was there, we were not told that there was any casualty. We were told that people came in and treatment is ongoing. And that formed the decision to go to the first school that was supposed to commence the palliative, which was done successfully. As soon as that was done, uh, myself and the, uh, the deputy governor of the state, we headed straight to the hospital, where at that point it was confirmed that two life was lost. All right. I was in Kefi throughout, and immediately the next day, I went to visit with those family. Right. Um, I was in the, uh, I was in Nashua Udege to meet with the family. I met with the parent, sympathize and uh, uh, show my concern. Right. Because now this is not about we is guilty as of now, but what we need to do to make sure that we condole with this family. Right. I spent time Mission with that. them and explained to them exactly what happened. And from there proceeded to the second uh, home where we met with the family uh, to express uh, our heartfelt condolence to them and looking forward to what else we can do to make sure that um, we, 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 con we, we, we spend more time in making sure that this thing does not happen again. Well, Commissioner, as we wind down now, so what would happen to the families? Are you paying compensation if you are? Just how much is it? Well, it can never be enough, but how much is it on the one hand? On the other hand, what is the uh, situation of the injured? Okay, so um, with the compensation, that cannot come from me, uh, but I'm quite sure um, in the wisdom of His Excellency, he will know the right thing to do. Um, my job now is constantly to monitor those families, to make sure that they at least in a better place um, trying to accept what has happened. Um, in terms of the student that went in, in, in the hospital, I was there yesterday morning, 
And um, previously I was there when I returned back from the visitation of the family. Uh, out of all the students that were there, I met with two students receiving treatment, but uh, stable condition because I had a conversation with them. I think one person's leg was fractured and she's been taken care of, but she's still on bed rest. And then the other kid right. um, is still there, but she was able to speak with me. I was told two students left for to get um, scanning done. And then the entire, the remaining student from what I uh, gathered from the hospital management that they've been DC. So our job now is to now see what we're gonna do for those students. And in reference to their medical bill, the state government have already assumed that responsibility. Right. And for the one that passed on, I'm quite sure His Excellency will be working towards what next we can do for those families. Well, Commissioner Margaret Alayo, we'll have to thank you so much. Um, it's rare to actually see, and it's commendable to see that you're choosing to be accountable in this, which is what government should be about. So thank you for your time. We'll be following up the story to ensure that the right things uh, are done. We'll be speaking with Commissioner Margaret Alayo, uh, Commissioner for Special Duties, Humanitarian Affairs and NGOs, and Asarawa State. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. We'll shift gears now and hear from the students themselves. The danger of a one-sided story, they say. So let's hear what exactly happened in a couple of seconds. Stay with us. scenes, palliative distribution turned into pandemonium at the Nasarawa State University and ended up in the loss of two lives. Two students lost their lives in unavoidable circumstances, uh, as you can see there. We've spoken to the commissioner 
uh, who's in charge of that process of distributing palliatives in Nassau State. But it's time to hear from the students. And we have joining us here in our Lagos studio, Akintay Batunde is the president of the Senate National Association of Nigerian Students, NANS. Good morning. Welcome to the morning break. Good morning. Thank you very much. I mean, a lot of Nigerians have seen that video. We've heard from the government just now. We heard from the commissioner. And it looks like there's a chain of responsibilities to be taken. The government responsible for sharing pilot tapes. But it also appears as though the school management and the student body were also involved in this. I know you have obviously been speaking uh, with the body there in Nasara State. And what are they telling you was the cause of that unavoidable death? The, what happened was that the Joint Campus Committee in Nasarawa, they wrote to the government that they want palliative and relief materials for students in Nasarawa State. So the government uh, approved 8,000 food package for each schools in the state and 20 million naira to be given to each student. So they started from Federal University of Lafia in Lafia. So it was even the governor that flagged it off. And I think the state government seems they have done about six schools. So what happened in Kefi? I think the, the government, because they think they have done other schools, it was successful. So instruction was given, but enforcement did not really follow in uh, National State University Kefi. Because the SUG the, the president, in conduction with the management, are supposed to come up with a list of students they believe are supposed to get the palliative. It is 8,000 packs, but for two, two per student and money. So a time was communicated to the students to come outside for the palliative, just as they have done in other schools. So that day, the JEC chairman said, they just see that students are going there themselves to pick the, the palliative themselves. When the time to start the program have not even, uh, it is not yet time to start the program. So when they see that some students are taking it, others also see the opportunity and see how open the access to the place is. So they just join them. You know students, there are different types of students. So opportunity to get the food and that was what led to the stampede. So was there no security? Obviously, there was no security. Yes. There wasn't appropriate barricades. Are those the things you are hearing as well? How many security operatives were they meant to have had there? How many did they have? What was the uh, organization plan? Uh, in a situation like this, there are supposed to be enough and adequate security. Because you don't think because it is successful in other schools, then you should be, you should be negligent with your duty in in other schools too because the way these students will react and the way the management will handle their situation is different from the way other schools should manage their situation so i think apart from the security from the management the government is also supposed to have provide a security a barricade because you know when it is issue of food and it involves students any little opportunity that the students see many of them want to take it at least to get some who get one, some who get some who even want to get more than the two. And there are some students on that campus that their name was was not on the list. So they believe that little opportunity when they see it, they want to take it to at least to their advantage. So those are the things that the management and the government are supposed to have prepared for. So I think that negligence and because they believe no everything will be fine yeah. was what has happened because there is there is a CSO, the chief security officer on that campus, who is also supposed to have known that uh, this school, this is my school, he knows the type of student, you know what can happen if they are if they should take any chances. And they, they took the chances by not even providing adequate security. Because even from the video you are seeing now, I don't think if you can see uh, securities around there trying to even stop the you know, page. So, so as, a, as an association, um, who are you holding responsible and what are you demanding? Uh, as an association, we have demand the government to investigate what really happened. We have asked them to at least get those that are supposed to do their job and they did not do it. In a situation like this, if people are not punished, if people are not made to face the consequence of their action, then continuously people will involve negligence in their duty. Do as we have requested that the, those that have injured their uh, hospital bed should be taken care of by the government. And sincerely, since these issues happen, the government has been cooperative. 
They have they've not been playing defensive role. They've take they've, they took responsibilities. They went to the hospital with some of our comrades down there and they've also promised to at least meet the parents of those that have lost their life and also compensate them, though they've not told us what they will do. But we are also saying above compensation, they should investigate and those that are responsible for that program, those that are supposed to monitor it to make sure it's went successfully. And this has happened and they should let people face the consequence of their action. So those are our demands from them. So while we're waiting for investigation, there are some things that are already emerging from our conversation with you. For instance, you have also said that there, the students knew that there was a list and perhaps if their names were not on that list, uh, that they may not get for that particular round of distribution. You've also said that the time was communicated for the distribution of the palliatives. But it appears as if, if I get you correctly, it appears as if um, the the distribution or the access for students to go and get their palliatives was allowed prior to the time of commencement am i correct yes those were those were the issues yes the issue was that you know in a, when you want to give palliative like that even when you've not started the program you have you have to secure the the venue very well because you know any even even if it is not student it might even be staff that have access to it they want to take they might want to take advantage of it so not securing that place and allowing the two access is what has caused the this. place was not secured one yes. do you know what time was communicated to the students for the commencement yeah, i think they said it the should be around two o'clock they will start the, two in the afternoon, yes, in the afternoon we'll start but the, uh, the students had okay. access prior to that yeah, time according to the, or in, the in morning, fact the commissioner said that as about 3 a.m the students had begun coming for the uh uh, to receive the palliatives. So who organized the distribution? The dis Are you aware? The distribution is... Who, who prepared that list also? The list is, a, is, a, is in relationship with the, the SUG, the school management, the student body and the school management. Because I think uh, with what we are, the list are prepared through the faculties, the department, in conduction with the student union government. So those are, those they are to make the list. But distribution are also not the sole aim of the management or the, or the student, body. student body. Because according to the information we had, the governor was supposed to be there. So flag of so the distribution. He flagged up the one in Lafia. All right. So the one in, in, in Kefi, was supposed to be the final stage so he was supposed to also be there for the distribution so which means the, the distribution is not even the duty of the school management they are mm. not to distribute the palliative themselves okay it is the government who have produced provide the palliative and they are the one to distribute the palliative so the governor was also supposed to be there according to the information we gathered from our comrades and the jc chairman in nasara state so the governor was supposed to be there to join them in distributing the palliative to the students so but due to what happened it was unable okay, to because additional, uh, additional sorry. sorry jeffrey because additional five thousand naira was supposed to be given Giving, as was given in other yes, 20, institutions 20 million to each school, so additional five thousand naira was supposed okay, to be so given. we should be looking at uh, the school management the f faculties and the student union government in asking further questions as we have asked here yes okay jeffrey. because what i was saying was I, the commissioner had said that they had to give that responsibility to the school so this information is a bit different from what I heard the commissioner the say. The responsibility they, are, they gave to the school is to get the the list of the beneficiaries. Not the sharing. Get the list of beneficiaries, provide the venue for the program, not the distribution. Okay. Because every other school they've gone, also gone to to do the program, it was not the school management that distributes the food themselves. And the money, it wasn't the school management that distributed it. Themselves. But is it the school that so, is supposed to also provide security? Not so the those that are providing the duty of those that are to provide the security is what we don't know. But I know school are supposed to provide security, and also the government are supposed to monitor the security of the program because this is not just a program by the school. So, so the the the, the five thousand naira per student was not handed over. The monies were not handed over to the faculty. No, no, it was not to the faculty. I think as you are getting your food, you'll be getting the So that is to, support, money, to uh, support what you're saying, that the, 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 author the government was supposed to handle the distribution. The distribution, yes. Right, so the money was not shared or has not been shared? It has not been shared, yes. Okay. Uh, well, you listen to the commissioner. You've also probably listened to the governor speak on this. Are you satisfied, particularly with um, 
uh, sanctions and, will I say, consequences for those who found wanting? What do you want to be done for those who are found culpable? Yes, we are. We are due to uh, so far the governors. Are, the governor have said anybody found wanting will lose his job, his or her job. And as far as investigation, as far as have investigated, and you are found wanting, you will lose your job because you did not do your job. That is what is happened. Some uh, students have died, and those that died, they are from. They, are, they belong to a family. They are people's children, and if we should just let it go like that, it's just as if we do not have respect for life. So they have promised that there will be consequence and the governors have also said there will be consequences. So we just want them to investigate and make sure the investigation is not right. taking too long. They investigate promptly and they give us the report of their investigation. But so far, we are, we are, we are satisfied with the, the action right. we are getting from the government. It was this event. You know, it was just meant to be a simple thing. You can even use their NIN. Uh, get them use it to verify them just meant to be a seamless process and that is the problem we have about not having data of students in this country and at least we have easy times without number i think there should be a, a way but but most of you have most of the students will have their nim uh, yes and that can be used can be used even for even them. bigger distributions yes. just use that and you don't have to but we have to thank you so much this is a story that is dear to us uh, because it concerns human life and also young Nigerians who, of course, have a bright future. I'd like to thank you so much uh, for sharing yeah. some insight. Uh, Akitaya Babatun is the president of the Senate, Nansa's National Association of Nigerian yeah. Students. Thank you for your time. And we'll be following the story thank you, no to problem. ensure that the yes, right sir. things are done, yes, even sir. for future distributions okay. as well. Thank you. Very much. Well, it's not all for this conversation, but we'll take a moment on this one. And when we return, we'll turn our attention to something vital to the life of our nation itself. You do not want to miss this conversation in a couple of seconds. So stay with us. Welcome back to the Morning Brief on Channels Television. Well, if you didn't know, a report in 2023 by the UNIDO, United Nations uh, Association for Industry and the African Union, adjudged Nigeria to be number two on the list of top 10 most industrialized countries in Africa. Now, that's cherry to note, but how much is Nigeria positioning uh, to ensure that most of uh, the equipment required for that industrialization uh, are homegrown. Let's have that conversation as we have. Joining us on the program this morning, the Executive Vice Chairman and CEO, National Agency for Science and Engineering Infrastructure, Naseni, Mr. Khalil Halilu. Mr. Khalilu Halilu, Mr. Halilu joins us from our Abuja studio this morning. Good morning and welcome to the program. Good morning. Uh, let's start by asking you to um, articulate exactly, uh, in order for Nigerians to understand, the mandate of the association. And while you're doing that, perhaps you can also add how the association is positioning uh, to provide homegrown um, equipment at, and to cut down, really, on Nigeria's uh, importation volume no, of the equipment, re re uh, of equipment required for industrialization. Well, um, the National Agency for Science and Engineering Infrastructure, NACENI, is the only purposely built uh, agency that uh, has the mandate to intervene in all areas of science and engineering infrastructure. Uh, so anything uh, from production uh, to research and development, making prototypes uh, and the likes. Uh, upon my assumption in office, um, I found out that Naseni has done a lot of research. We have about uh, you know, 12 institutes across the country and um, about uh, 100 plus uh, prototypes of uh, different products, you know, from uh, home care products uh, to electric uh, appliances you know, and the likes. And uh, one thing we, I wanted to do differently you know, is to bring uh, these products to market by means of commercializing them. And in order to do that, uh, we introduced a program called Accelerated Technology Transfer and the Triple C, uh, which is creation, uh, uh, commercialization, and collaboration, uh, both with private uh, entities and government uh, agencies in and outside the country. 
so uh, we've been uh, doing a lot of shopping around the country and uh, outside the country for partners to do this accelerated technology transfer where we leverage on existing infrastructure. We don't have to build uh, everything from scratch. Uh, we've seen a lot of hardworking SMEs that have put in together a lot of work and uh, can be supported you know, to build uh, this infrastructure. So I know that um, when you came on board, there was a lot of headlines about your age, a young man is taking over Naseni, um, 32 year old, just I think just a month to your birthday. So a lot of things happened that period, like, because when, when I read your history, you're quite almost a restless, curious child growing up, literally from uh, ice selling to even music distribution, down to DJing and all of that. So you have a history for just providing solution. So I will want to ask a straight and simple question. For the last six months or thereabouts since you took over, what would you say is the high point of your leadership at Naseni? Because infrastructure is absolutely necessary. And given how the hype that came with it, everybody's expecting a lot from a young Nigerian. Well, I think the high point will be the, uh, the fact that we are able to rebrand uh, Naseni, which we call the new Naseni or a new Naseni, and uh, we're able to attract investment. Uh, when we were in China for the Belt and Road uh, Forum, we were able to attract about $2 billion uh, in investment for various sectors uh, in the country. And um, another thing is when we're in the UAE uh, for the COPS28 uh, conference, we're also able to attract $150 million for production of uh, lithium batteries. Uh, the key thing is uh, the complete turnaround in Naseni uh, to give it a new face and uh, also an opening uh, hands and uh, restructure the organization internally to become more business friendly. We're one of the few government entities allowed to commercialize uh, our products. And that has been uh, attracting a lot of uh, attention and a lot of uh, investors. And um, I think that is the key thing where we're able to show what we can provide to private sector uh, in exchange, you know, for, for leverage. Uh, and uh, we've seen that happen a lot. Currently, we're talking about close to 30 products that are commercially ready. And recently, we launched uh, three out of the uh, products, which is one, which is uh, the solar or electric KK, and uh, the, our solar home systems, considering the heat wave that is going on in the country, where you can buy a solar kit and uh, pay over time uh, with our payment plant. And... Um, the last uh, but not the least, you know, we're talking about our lithium uh, batteries, you know, that, uh, you know, we've collaborated with another firm, you know, to produce. And you keep on seeing more and more of these products. We're targeting before the end of the year, we'll have about 40 products and we have showrooms in key states. Uh, the whole idea is, uh, you know, we need to build a middle class. And uh, as you know, Mr. President's agenda is number one, to reduce pressure on the Naira. Number two, to be able to, uh, you know, earn Forex uh, by means of export. And of course, to be able to create jobs. And you see all the activities that we are doing, you know, they aligned uh, with the Renewed Hope agenda, as well as tick all the key boxes, uh, you know, that are uh, of pains to us currently in the country. Well, one of those pains, and I think it will rank top, is food, agriculture. And what will be industrialization without food, agriculture, in fact? Without that, there's nothing, literally. I know there was a controversy or the debate around just how many tractors we have in the country. We have need for 70 plus thousand tractors or more. And minister that said we had just 5,000. Some said, well, we have more. But the point is, we're not mechanizing agriculture as we ought to. We're still battling with people doing subsistence farming when we should be feeding millions with mechanized agriculture. And that talks about, you know, all of the farming implements or at least in this case, the... Uh, <laughs> Uh, the, the the tractors and the rest. So, what are you doing in that line to ensure that we are we are moving beyond? I mean, Unido's ranking ranking us eighth might be tricky because other rankings even put us way far uh, from that one. So, what are we doing to ensure that agriculture is properly mechanized, particularly from your angle? Well, we are doing two key projects uh, for now uh, with regards to agriculture. Number one, there's the tractor recovery program. Um, from our statistics, there are about over 50,000 tractors that are not put to use in Nigeria because uh, they've been dilapidated or abandoned and the likes. 
So we've been approaching uh, state governors. Uh, we've done pilot in Niger State. Uh, we have an ongoing project in Kebi, you know, and uh, we'll do more in other parts of the country. And this program, what we do is we put these structures back to use. And uh, we do it in such a way that uh, we don't put so much burden, you know, to the states. So uh, it's like a swap program. We come, we identify about 100 tractors, for example. Uh, we fix all and, uh, you know, we, we negotiate, you know, with the state governors as to how many they are going to take and the rest, you know, we put them back uh, to use to be able to earn revenue to sustain, uh, you know, the model. So this has been going on very well. And in fact, uh, we're extending it to what we call the vehicle recovery program. Uh, recently, uh, we were with the Nigerian police. They have a lot of uh, vehicles that they want to put back uh, to use. So uh, therefore, reducing, uh, you know, government spending. The second program we have, uh, you know, on the agriculture is we recently developed, uh, you know, solar irrigation system. Uh, which we've test run uh, during our Senate uh, committee uh, visit. And uh, this uh, device is, we believe it's going to be a key driver uh, for the Irrigate Nigeria program, uh, which is one of the renewed hope uh, uh, agenda promises, where you enable farmers to, you know, harvest multiple times uh, during the year. And we believe that will, uh, you know, address the issue around uh, food security. Currently, we have a demo farm of about 2,000 hectares in Jigawa, uh, where we are, you know, test running different ways of uh, irrigating uh, our lands. And the results will be able to replicate them towards the end of the year in different parts of the country. And uh, we are taking this irrigation thing very, very serious and is one of the top agendas uh, for Mr. President. And uh, Naseni is on the driver's seat. Okay, interesting. Um, this irrigation you talk about, is it from your product uh, solar irrigation system? Quick confirmation before I ask my question. Yes, it is solar from... irrigation system. Okay, brilliant. Uh, and thank you, Kadi, for that uh, correction, by the way. The UNIDO report ranks Nigeria eighth uh, out of the top 10 African most industrialized countries. Your products are quite interesting. Electric kekena pep, uh, solar home systems, solar irrigation equipment. But, you know, but on what scale are you producing these products, manufacturing them? Um, you know, because in Nigeria, for instance, we have quite a number of kekena pep. Uh, that's the tricycles. But some of them, or most of them are imported into the country uh, from some reports from India. So on what scale are you manufacturing these equipment such that uh, they can be deployed to use nationwide to reduce our consumption of fuel, you know, and uh, uh, liberalize the economy to an extent and the other products as well? On what scale? So, uh, I mean, we try to achieve a large scale uh, production. So what we try to do uh, with our shopping uh, all over the world with uh, you know, uh, partners or people that are already selling in Nigeria is to give them incentive as to why they should stop just uh, you know, shipping to Nigeria and uh, coming to establish. Uh, so one of the things that we offer them is our national brand, of course, Naseni. Uh, the president being the chairman, we have 11 uh, uh, ministers as uh, board members, including the CBN governor. So that is a big selling point. Uh, number two, everyone that wants to invest in, a co in any country, they want to know uh, they are with the government and they are well protected. And we also try to partner with a lot of state governors to provide other incentives, you know, for these uh, people or companies to come into this country and invest. And we have seen that happen, you know, in various uh, uh, sectors and examples. And what we try to do is, uh, you know, do baby steps uh, so that we don't end up having a uh, white elephant project. Anyone that is shipping uh, and uh, sort of dumping goods here, how do we encourage them to start as, as little as assembly? You know, then we go to semi knockdown and complete, no, completely knockdown products. Uh, because we know the terrain is tough here. And, uh, you know, you have, to, you have to be careful on how you manage it in order not to scare the investors uh, away. And uh, if you take a look at our budget this year, about 80% of it, it, it go, is going into counterpart funding. This shows how serious we are when it comes to uh, collaboration. And we want to optimize government money so we don't invest 100% uh, in these activities by ourselves. We always look for uh, private equity uh, you know, to partner with and also share more knowledge. The key thing that we uh, offer, you know, aside the brand, 
is the fact that uh, we're able to help them domesticate uh, these technologies and commercialize it locally. Uh, because uh, in a place like Nigeria, if you don't know the terrain very well, it's very, very difficult you know, uh, you know, to penetrate uh, the market especially. So we see how we can look for local partners, you know, for the international collaborators. Mm. And for the local partners that are doing well, we see how we can upscale uh, what they are doing. Uh, but essentially, we understand our terrain is different and how can we domesticate these different technologies? And the ones that have done well, how do we upscale uh, them? Let's go back to December signing of that uh, agreement with Shenzhen, the Chinese company, in collaboration with uh, REA, uh, the $150 million deal for the lithium iron processing and manufacturing, which is quite important to all of us as Nigerians because everybody is looking at renewable energy and uh, with Tesla and all of these companies producing all of this car, it creates an opportunity, I think, in places like Nassau and a couple of other states. Walk us through what the detail of that agreement is and um, how far you've gone with it. Because we had to have this, con had this conversation because not, not many people know Nasemi. And I'm happy you're trying to rebrand so that it becomes, you know, a street talk or uh, has street value. That, that's what I meant to say. Uh, but with your project, I'm sure that's going to happen. So let's talk about this 150 million naira lithium deal. What are the details? How far has it gone? What does it mean? Okay, so interestingly, uh, Naseni approached uh, REA, the Rural Electrification Agency, to identify what value you know we could add to the existing work they are doing. And everyone is aware that you know they procure a lot of solar street lamps, uh, lithium batteries, and the likes, you know, for the for their activities. And uh, we uh, engaged them and said, you know, we'd like to have a local play uh, for what you know you are doing uh, right now. And they said, well, uh, they're happy to work with us. Being a government agency, you know, everything becomes easier, G2G uh, collaboration. So we signed an MOU with REA that if we're able to deliver, uh, you know, products that are of uh, good quality and uh, meet their standards, you know, they will procure them, no doubt about that. And simply by doing that announcement, you know, we began to see a lot of... Uh, companies both locally and internationally approaching us and you know to collaborate some saying you know that we don't even need to invest anything uh, they just want to work with our brand uh, so we're able to put standards and attracted you know a couple of companies uh, one is Shenzhen uh, you know there are others that are also doing uh, solar street lamps and the whole idea is to as much as possible bring local components into the existing activities that we're, we're doing because some of these companies already in Nigeria market, but they are just shipping uh, and, and just selling. We're not even uh, assembling here. And interestingly, we found out that Shenzhen has a market in uh, uh, American, uh, far America, around Brazil, you know. So we were able to identify that if you set up a factory in a place like Lagos, it will reduce their shipping time, you know, to those uh, countries, therefore uh, exporting and earning forex. So uh, this uh, partnership, as we speak, you know, the equipment are on the way to Nigeria, uh, but uh, knowing, uh, you know, the new Nasini's aggressive approach, we are already uh, shipping uh, products that are designed by Naseni, produced elsewhere, uh, while working towards setting up the factory so that we reduce, uh, you know, go to market time. You know, one of the issues we've seen with a big project such as this one is uh, well, what we can call a sad trend, really, where you hear about officials seeking certain percentage of a contract sum. They call it what is it? Uh, yeah, but there's a name they have for it. Is it supervision fee or whatever? And they go in cash, uh, from what we hear, to those officials, and the monies are embezzled. And naturally, if a project is meant to cost 20 billion and you've taken some millions from it, you cannot achieve that project. So that's why we have abandoned project, substandard projects, and most times the people never get to enjoy, uh, you know, those projects from government, be it roads buildings and in this case we're talking about uh, you know some of these equipment we know that the efcc is investigating the former rea boss and jeffrey referenced the fact that you signed an agreement with the rea regarding that so naturally there'll be a spotlight on your office as well you are young nigerian you represent millions of nigerians and we expect you to be a beacon of light so can you speak pointedly to that issue 
would you be that kind of official who will be demanding 5%? You have to give me 5% if you want to do this project. You have to give me a certain percentage. Is that the kind of official you are? Well, I came from the private sector uh, six months ago, and uh, I understand the effects uh, these kind of things have, you know, and how it slows down businesses. And to be honest, uh, if we are collecting 5%, uh, we wouldn't be where we are today here. Uh, we have over 30 products that are commercially viable. And, uh, you know, at that speed, uh, you, you know, it's clear that, you know, we're not collecting 5 or 2%. And... Um, you know, we need to put, you know, the country first, and uh, that is most uh, Im important. And you see all the places where you have high corruption index, you know, you're not able to move, you know, at that, uh, you know, speed. One thing that I, you know, found uh, uh, very, very interesting and uh, it gave me joy was uh, last week, one of my very, very old uh, uh, classmates, you know, from uh, university had a project and I wasn't even aware and uh, it was just at the closing, uh, you know, uh, ceremony of the, or the flag off of that project, you know, that I said, ah, uh, Oga, where have you been? And he said, oh, he moved to Canada and then now moved back to Nigeria. So we've put systems in place. Uh, today, if you have a proposal, you can go, you know, straight to our website, you know, fill in a form. And the evaluation is automated, you know, uh, and we, on, and everyone, you know, on our uh, team understands that. We have wrote to the president that, you know, we need special, uh, you know, package for the hardworking people, you know, in Naseni so that they don't get distracted, you know, by the billions that, you know, we're constantly signing and they just focus, you know, on the on the kind of work that they are doing. But uh, more story of, uh, we'll tell more, more of this story, you know, as the times come, uh, because people will be wondering how we're able to do so much within a short period of time. So are you telling us that you're not that kind of, I want you to vouch to millions of Nigerians listening to you yes, right I'm now. Yes, I'm not that kind of, uh, <laughs> I'm not a 5% person. <laughs> is it, is that, does that mean it is more or it is less or you don't take at all and whomever takes in your office I, I don't and there will be consequences? <laughs> okay, so... Uh, it's Definitely on record. There will be consequences. It's on record now, so your clients can reference this interview to say that the executive vice chairman of Naseni doesn't take any percentage at all. And we hope that beyond the application on your website, uh, the process for um, you know uh, uh, putting forward their contracts, the applications, you know, are just as seamless. It's a good thing that you've referenced that um, you're, you're doing a lot of partnerships with the private sector, uh, a lot of the equipment are being shipped, but the ultimate goal really should be that eventually uh, raw materials, the manufacturer equipment are locally uh, made to reduce uh, capital flight and the exportation of jobs. Uh, but um, in those commercially viable products that you talk about, how much support are you getting from the National Assembly, which, by the way, um, in the 2024 budget has referenced uh, the planned provision of solar street lights in a lot of their constituencies? Mm -hmm. And in addition to that, speak to us about how um, you are encouraging the support of these commercially viable products as made in Nigeria, you know, and the purchase by government agencies at all levels of these made in Nigeria products? Well, uh, this gives me an opportunity to give uh, special thanks, you know, to the two chairmen, uh, you know, uh, on Naseni committee of the National Assembly because they have been very, very supportive. Uh, they've taken me uh, as a younger brother, which, uh, you know, is a privilege that I'm still uh, enjoying. And, uh, you know, they've from the first time we met, they told us uh, they wanted uh, to see products. And I told them I'm a product guy, you know. So, uh, you know, we beat the target that they gave us, you know, for first quarter, you know, to be able to show, uh, showcase those products. And they are happy with it. Uh, channels also covered, uh, you know, uh, that event. And uh, my next target is uh, how I can uh, turn my two chairmen into marketers, you know, for our solar street lamps uh, and also transform our project that we're working on. Because there is... Each and every member of the National Assembly, you know, buy solar street lamps, buy transformers for their constituency. And uh, I think that should be our number one, uh, you know, uh, market or number one spot that we're going to hit. And I'm sure I'm hundred and uh, very positive that they are going to patronize Nasoni products. So uh, just as a round of, I know you generate money uh, and government also invest in you by allocating some uh, 
monies to the agency. How much has Nasani generated so far, so good, to the Federation account? Or are you really making money? Yes, uh, we're making money, uh, but it's not time to close accounts yet. Uh, it's still something we're keeping, uh, you know, uh, on the low before time to publish uh, accounts, yes. So uh, once, it's, uh, once it's time, we're going to make it uh, public. Uh, it's not a secret. Um, but now I don't have the exact numbers, and I don't want to be held uh, accountable to that. You know, the reason I ask that question, you come from a private sector like us, so we're always ready with numbers in terms of finances. So maybe the next time we have you, uh, we, will, we will need those numbers so that people will know whether or not you're really making progress, because that's the only metrics we can actually use to measure progress. Carrie. Absolutely. Uh, but it's cherry to, to have this interview. It's obviously the first of many. We need to bring this back to the consciousness of Nigerians and ensure that uh, all our agencies, GOEs and all of that, make profit. And it's not just budgeting money, but we get profit from it. And, and, and he's a young man, so, oh, yes. so we're we looking at you to, to make Nigeria proud. You're 33 years now, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Don't worry, don't worry, so Jeff, Jeff, Jeffrey keeps birthday. asking. <laughs> Jeffrey's going to get you a birthday gift on your next birthday. I need birthday, <laughs> All right, so we hope that when you, you indeed turning those numbers, they will be in the realms of hundreds of billions of naira to showcase the potential of Naseni, you know, uh, uh, as a contributor of Nigeria's gross domestic product. We'd like to thank you very much, Mr. Khalil Halilu, the Executive Vice Chairman, CEO, National Agency for Science and Engineering, infrastructure naseni thank you for coming on the morning brief thank you and we shift gears now to the softer side of things as we look at hyper realism stay with us we'll be right back
So the question is, what you just saw, are they pictures, are they drawings? What exactly are they? That's why Olumide Arashago joins us as an iPod Realist artist on the program to explain how that happens. Welcome to the program. Thank you very much. So I asked the question. Yeah. Maybe you need to answer first before I ask my other question. Okay. Is that drawing or picture? Uh, that's actually paintings. Oh, paintings. Yeah. That's what it's called. Yeah. So what was true? what this hyperrealism is when it comes to the artistry uh, of what you do because we are seeing a lot of things trying to create threat to some of this natural artistry we see around the world yeah um actually when it comes to an hyperrealist hyperrealist is a kind of art that um actually existed uh, started around 1980s by some of the american artists but you know we've not been able to get to that level here in Africa. So um, most of the high level of art that we do in Africa are impressionist style and abstract art and probably traditional um, art as well. But you know, when hyperrealism came, came as a result of the increase and the, the level of, at which photograph uh, company produce their um, high mega resolution high images you know, most of artists in those period decided that whatever a photograph can do, they can do more better. Mm. So mm. decided to follow and try to like do be their best in order to uh, be able to match with the photograph um, pictures. So that's coined the word hyperrealism because he's a realist artist initially, but when it comes to a level at which is being um, we in between an iPad, um, a photograph and, and a, a realist paintings. So we decided to like see how this thing looks more like a photograph. Mm. And it's as real as real can get. If you look at this one, you know, staring us in the face, for instance, look at the water dripping. It's very, very close to real life. Yeah. And that brings me to my question. You know, for those who would say I would go to um, an art studio and ask an artist to get my portrait, portrait drawn, yeah. this trumps that by all respect. So it, it, it's the same field, really, but... Yeah. Are you taking the market off of the artists who draw um, the portrait for people who would like their portrait done? Okay, you, are you saying in terms of um, the camera uh, pictures? No, no, in terms of drawings as well. Yeah, you know, the level at which my heart has gotten right now has exceeded the expectation of an African artist because I've been able to like, train under so many artists that are impressionist artists and have undergo all the class classical art of um, arts and uh, adding those elements into um, trying to copy a picture from a photograph and trying to like mimic what the, um, um, the images you are seeing in front of you adding all those things together you can be able to like see that you are not just an ordinary artist because at the end of the day, when you when you left school, you study an art um, in, a, in an art school, and you left, you decided to like do something for yourself, and you want to challenge yourself and challenge the market, and you want something unique for yourself, and you want to coin your name, so you have to do something yeah. extraordinary for you to stay on ground in that um, art line. And that's exactly what you have done for yourself, and you've built even further. A lot of people might remember 2016, March, when yeah. you went viral, yeah. and people kept asking, no, this cannot be a painting, this has to be a picture. You've seen some of those images that yeah. he went viral with, and he's been waxing stronger. The beauty of this conversation today is that we're, we're not just talking. Yeah. You have your easel here. You explain to us this tool, because it is not an everyday thing that yeah, we see. This, so. the, this, yeah. Yeah, this easel is um, a, an um, instrument material that we use in place in our drawings. Sometimes an artist can use this easel to place a, is a color, probably an outdoor painters. This is exactly what we use as an outdoor. But because I'm not painting, I'm just drawing here, I could not come along with my colors and um, everything. So because there's no time for us to have 
paintings done right. in the studio here because of the um, little time we have. Absolutely. So we'll try to make the most of the little time we have. I understand that you, you plan to do something interesting. It's not oil on canvas today, but yeah. you're planning to do something <laughs> we'll interesting. Absolutely. We'll so tell us what you want to do, and we'll get started, and, and we'll be chatting yes, back I'm, and forth. I'm going to be having a drawing of um, one of us here. Who do we choose? Uh, we can choose her. We should choose yeah. the lady, right? Ladies because we're gentlemen. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Bukola, Absolutely. This is your 20 minutes of, of fame. extra fame. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, walk us through the process. When you want to do a sketch, what do you start with? Yes, I, I first of all look at the overall image of the um, model that I'm drawing mm. and mm. see the features that stand out first mm. and look towards how I'm going to start from that features and go down Let, let's let you start uh, let, i don't what, know what stands out for you what do you need me to do yes you can just sit down or probably stand you can stand right she, yeah. she can stand right yeah she, okay she, let's get to work so okay. uh we're, we're going to be chatting with you you can start uh do you okay, do you chat impression. when you're sketching is yes, that something you also yeah. do oh, <clears throat> fantastic okay so that's the idea uh ladies and gentlemen we're going to be chatting with him while he's uh, trying to get an impression or uh, image of Bukola using his pen, uh, whatever it is that he uses to draw. So at the end of the conversation, we will show you what has uh, happened eventually. So uh, let's go back to a bit of the conversation. A lot of young people are looking at this and are like, okay, this is something I can do. I think I have this talent because basically it's about talent first. I, I hope you're still drawing. Yeah. Okay, uh, absolutely. Okay, because we're going to be chatting with you as your <laughs> ear. Uh -huh. So, um, Talk to us about what young people need to know when it comes to hyper-realistic uh, expression. Yeah, you know, as an hyper, if you want to become an artist first, you need to become, have the passion for being an artist. Yeah. The passion to draw, the passion to think, the passion to um, have an idea, and the passion to create. You know, all those things combined together has to be in your mindset before you become an artist because an artist is a visionary thing, person. And you think far, what are you going to talk about? What are you going to see? What is your, your background like? What is your experience like? You know, you have to have everything in your back of mind before you think of uh, saying you want to become an artist because you can become an artist and become an architect. Mm. True. So you can become an artist and become a, a, a social commentator because you are trying to like tell a story of how the environment is, right. you know. So it depends on how, if you now want to become a visual artist, so you, all what you are going to be saying will be with your hand and your mind. So as an artist, you, you tend to like uh, become conscious of your environment the story you want to tell the people, whether you want to tell the story of African arts, you want to tell the story of, of, of where you, you were born, or your, your locality. So all those things um, will be in, your, in your, your subconscious mind before becoming an artist. So when you have... I know that this is a bit tricky, and you're, you're intelligent, you're brilliant. So we'll give you like 30 seconds or so to develop this yeah. and just allow the audience enjoy the sketching Let process. Yeah. Then we'll come back to the conversation. So let's just okay. allow you sketch for a moment. Okay. And I see you're using a pen, so do your thing. Then in the next 30 seconds or more, we'll continue the conversation. Okay.
Well, what are you expecting to see? <laughs> you are the model right there, so let, let's find out what you want. I'm trying to put my feeling into words right now. It feels kind of surreal to be the object of an artist's uh, creative intention and intensity. I'm mm. trying to. <laughs> wow, wow. I'm trying to stay still, you know. But I, I know that I'm already put together, and I, whatever's going to come out is just going to be uh, an expression of God's creation. Let me just say that you're made for this. <laughs> uh, this it looks like you were just born with this. The news and it's perfect. Now we see how things are coming up. It's quite interesting to see that he's using a pen. Mm -hmm. You know, there are levels to this. I mean, some people use crayons, some people use pencils, and it's tough. And I wouldn't say for anybody here, yeah. but he's using a pen. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 I think it's, it's, it's exp it shows a level of mastery. Yeah, he's done this over and mm -hmm. over and over. And I, I heard what he said. Look, the prominent feature is what they think of or think through first. Yeah. So maybe the face, the shape of the face, the shape of the mouth, the eye, and then they begin to do all the fine details to create exactly what you would like to see, and maybe the hair and all of that. Uh, so it's, it's for him to use some of these things he uses that regular people like us may not be able to use. Uh, shows that he's mastered it. And to do it within a short time, on we have. Under pressure. On, on that, way, no, no, do you feel present? I'm just doing my thing. Right? Because <laughs> it's important. You need to find that state of, uh, what, what's the word now? Just balance. In equilibrium. In, thank you yeah, very yeah, much. Thank you very much. In equilibrium. That's the mm. word I was looking for. So does it help you as well? Is this therapeutic for you? when you Yeah, of course. Speech? This is one of the things um, you do over and over again. And it's, it has been part of you. So it's not something um, that I've not, I've not seen before. You know, as, as, I'm, as I'm looking at him, eh, it just brings to focus nature's mystique and beauty, how the senses are relaying a lot of things. So he's using his eyes to right. look at Bokola, and then a lot of things going through his mind and finding expression, expression through his hands. Right. It's, it's a lot of coordination of nature. Your hand, eye and coordination. So it, it, it's, it's quite brilliant to see all the senses being put together. And then uh, when I did it, in, when I did science, yes, when I did science, they, they call it the six degrees of uh, the robots, for instance, uh, more like an inflection. So you have your phalanges, so you have one, two, three, four, five, six. So all of this come together. That's how they create robots. So, yes. They're working together yes, at the same time. Yes, working together. So all of this. So whatever is thinking in his head, uh, the, the, this, this six degree of, I've forgotten the right expression now, but they call it degree something. They w have to work together to find the expression, which is quite critical. So I'm just looking at the beauty and mystique of nature in the ability to create, just using the eyes and interpreting with the hands. Mm. I mean, I'm just taking pictures away. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm taking pictures of yes, him I remember sketching. It's called six degrees of freedom. Right. Yes, in robotics, six Brilliant. degrees of freedom. So Brilliant. the phalanges, is one, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, I get six. it. Your six degrees of freedom. And I'm trying to stay still and not make my mind work <laughs> too much. Is that, is that really tough? To help what the process. Is that tough? Uh, well, uh, not too tough. Okay, you should get used to it. It looks like you're made for this. <laughs> it's going to be tough because you haven't done it before. <laughs> and that is pressure. So how long does it typically take to do this quick sketch for you? Um, I think in the next uh, 20 to 15 minutes, I think. Which we don't have. <laughs> we should have. But we don't with the head at least. <laughs> yes, yes. In, in we can see something minutes. close. We have just barely less than five minutes, uh, about four minutes to, to wrap up the show. So hey, guys, we're looking at uh, uh, hyperrealist artists uh, trying to find expression. Bukola is trying to stay still. Uh, this is the stillest she has stayed in a very long time. She has to just stay and be smiling. And I wonder if she wants to smile or not. <laughs> so because the guys never tire of telling me that I'm not come. still. Mm. So, uh, me, me. I was hoping that you would say something to them. So I'm trying to help you too, because I know it's really tough to, yeah. to do this. By the way, I mean, you look good already. So, so let, let's see so how I, this I wish you was painting so they can capture the, maybe the sweat and the hairline mm -hmm. and all of that. So Mr. Olumide is doing his bit to ensure that, hey, 
Okay, I'm beginning to see Bukola around this. Wow. Yeah. So Bukola, I'm not sure whether you were smiling or you were, but, but we can see Bukola already, like, it's coming out. Does together. it look like me? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, with a pen, by the way. Pen. We need to reiterate that this is a pen, <laughs> so you don't have, you can't erase anything, you cannot make modifications. It just shows the brilliance uh, of Mr. Oreshegun. A lot of us might remember he went viral 2016. His images have gone viral time and again, with people asking, is this real? Is this a picture, or is this a painting, or is this AI? Yeah, I, I, and, that, and that one with the AI children swimming AI. in the pool is my favorite. You know, it makes you want to jump into the pool, mm. you know, as well, and just become a child again. Yeah. It's, it, it's that real and compelling to both appreciate and, and, and to watch. I think for me, what, what's very captivating is the water on mm -hmm. some of those pictures. Uh, there's a lot of interaction of light here. Mm -hmm light your ability because you can see whether it's a key light on the left and then a little bit on the right hand side and all of that so they are very deliberate to tell you with these pictures this is where the light is actually coming from this is where the light is behind and this is where all of that so oh boy this so you have is to be very uh, delicate quite, with it quite a, a job to do and uh, how expensive is it to get a painting or oh, how affordable are you? Let's say, I don't know. Because we know you've traveled Especially the world. Especially yeah. after the 2016 work going viral. I'm sure your prices have gone up. Yeah, absolutely. Factoring inflation, oh. exchange rates. <laughs> exchange rates. <laughs> you know, we, we, don't, we don't deal with Naira, all these days. We deal with dollars now. So, which means you get a lot of um, uh, jobs from outside the country. Yeah, and yeah. I know you've had to travel a yeah, lot. Yeah. So, how is that going as well? Yes, going fine. I think I've been able to exhibit in so many places and showcase Nigerian culture in so many places around the world, mm -hmm. and which is um, an advantage for me and for the whole nation because of the fact that um, I'm trying to tell the story of Africa and Nigerian as a whole. Mm -hmm. from my concept so and the, re the response is so great and uh, i'm happy guys don't forget uh, in case it doesn't finish exactly the time we we have to end the show in about two three minutes mm -hmm. uh but as soon as it's done We'll put up this picture on our handle, CTV Morning Brief, on Twitter. Uh, go to our Instagram page and all the social media platforms. Uh, we'll ensure that, hey, uh, you get to see that picture in its full glory. So uh, maybe Whoa, we'll, we'll pin the Coca Cola for a bit. So, uh, uh, my, uh, my blushes on both cheeks, are absolutely. they that obvious? <laughs> because that's what I'm seeing staring me in my face on the camera well, I, <laughs> I can see Bukola, you're meant to stay still stay still it's not, and it's not even done it's yet done. by the way uh, so I, I was going to raise the point that your your studio is still in um, Ikorodu am I correct yeah so it's from Ikorodu to the world literally yes and it just speaks to I mean I get to the world exactly the fact that it doesn't matter where you are to where you're from if your work is good I mean, you, you'd always get that much needed fame attention. And in this case, the Forex mm -hmm. that he's getting as well. That he's getting also. Now that we need all the dollars we can get uh, for the country. So quite an impressive performance already by Mr. Oresha Gon Olumide, a uh, hyper-realist artist who is trying to capture as much as he can within the time we have of Bukola's image. And, uh, well, any last thought before we, we can't just leave you drawing. You have to say a thing or two because we're going to put out this drawing at the end of the show okay. on our social media platform. Um, what, wow. Like, most of the things I'm doing right now, it's, it's something that uh, I've been doing for years. And I've been able to, like, metamorphose into different kind of ideas and different kind of stories to tell uh, people. Uh, you know, initially we were, I'm, I'm known with the water thing, but uh, right now I'm talking about an African culture, how we can be able to like imbibe mm. the the um, importance of our fashion sure. into because. We don't want institution by our fashion. We go in a, 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 a extension, a station, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, if we 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 see an artist trying to like tell the story of of where he is from, that is gonna go a long way in sure. telling right. who the person is. So that's the kind of concept I'm working on towards 
and I'm working on for over uh, two years now. Uh, do you take students? I just wanted to find out. Do you take students? I know you must be uh, well demanded for, but do you take students? In 10 seconds. Mm, yes, I do take students, but you know, it's not every time because mm -hmm. of the time um, schedule of mine. I think I took, I think um, some students as well. Right. Yeah. Wow. I gotta go now, guys. No, you have to stay the way you, you are. Have to stay. You have to stay. <laughs> so just say your goodbye so that we can focus on us. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's been um, an honor being a model for Olumide, Mr. Olumide Oreshego, hyperrealism artist. But more importantly, it's uh, good to be a model and a force for good. Thank you for watching this morning and join us through the entire week. I am Bukola Koka. And of course, Olumide Oreshego, thank you so much for thank coming through much. with your artistry. Thank you for watching. I'm Jeffrey Ozanga. Hey, let's all be muses in some way. Enjoy those moments of life. Be still and ensure to have a great day ahead. I'm Kaido Kikyolo. Yes, we'll go back to this painting or this sketch. Bye, Bukola. Stay still. Absolutely. So we'll just walk around and. Bukola. All right, bye bye. Bukola, don't move anymore. Bukola, don't move. We'll be right back. We'll be right back. Stay where you are.